what's happening. <laughs> well, good, good morning to everyone, those of you all here and those who are watching online or in the drive-in. I'm glad to be here. Uh, man, it's pretty awesome. If you are new here and don't know who I am, I am Jason Earls. I am the teaching pastor here. I live in Dallas, Texas, so I fly up once a month to hang out with my Gold Creek family. Uh, yeah, so... So if you are new, I'd love to meet you in the lobby right after service at our, um, our newcomer's table. Um, man, a sage of wisdom, sage of taste of wisdom. As I shared last month when Pastor Dan first told me that our series is called Sage, I was like, bro, that's witchcraft. I don't know what are we talking about. <laughs> But understanding that sage means wisdom, sage means old, wise, old, you know. Uh, I said, man, the best way I can talk about sage in a good way is to put on a chef suit. So today we will feast from the book of Proverbs. Now on this table I have three main dishes that are going to illustrate the three main points for today's message. What we've done, we've taken the Proverbs out of our one-year Bible reading. If you're in that, hey, keep, keep it going. If you're not, just jump on board. And so what we've done is for each point, I've come up with this, something that symbolizes it. So what we'll do, is just start off playing. Yes, yeah, so a first point comes from this dish. This dish is something that many of us, well, many of us don't necessarily like. And some of us have the nerve to eat. This is a snake. That's exactly what I'm talking about. If you didn't hear online, somebody just said, ew. Now, round of applause if you've ever eaten snake. That is absolutely ridiculous. That's probably like maybe 10 people who eat snake. Does it taste good? Tastes like chicken, huh, I guess. <laughs> so if you were to guess what our first point is, every point starts with this. We're going to take a look at three things. The first one that we're taking a look at, the first thing is taking a look at what is represented by a snake. What do you think it is? Type it in the chat if you watch Sin. That's a pretty good guess. Somebody guessed that. That is incorrect, though. You're kind of in the ballpark, though. I gave it, kind of giving it away. What does a snake represent? Come on. I can, get, get, backstabbing? Deceit? We're getting close. Who? Satan? Somebody, I heard it right there. Evil. Go ahead. He was in the first service. That's how he knew that. <laughs> A snake represents evil for today, uh, so we're going to take a look at evil. The first verse is Proverbs 20 and verse 30. Proverbs 20 and verse 30. Check this out. Physical punishment cleanses away evil. Such discipline purifies the heart. Whoa. No one really likes discipline. In fact, if you're from the South, like me, we call discipline the good old-fashioned woodshed. Now, I know when some of us read this verse, we automatically, most of us read our context that we grew up in into this verse. Physical punishment. For me, when I see physical punishment, the first thing I think about is a switch, a belt, a strap, a paddle, a stenching cord, an iron, a tire. A, I'm just playing, y'all. I'm just playing. Relax. <laughs> a wrench. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So if you come from a home that, that used physical punishment or f physical discipline, that's what you read. If you didn't, you don't read that into this. So the, the, the interesting thing is, 
There are some verses. One verse said, wickedness is in the heart of a child, but the rod will drive him far away from it. This verse, when you look at the Hebrew language, it's not clear if it's talking about a parent spanking a child or a parent putting a child in time out or talking to them. Regardless, it says that physical punishment cleanses away evil. It works. Discipline works. However you decide to discipline your children, sorry kids, one thing that works very well in my house is a cell phone. Woo! Bro, <laughs> oh my goodness. If my, <laughs> I took away a cell phone, we, we have rules in our house. The rules are simple. Cell phones go at this particular place in our house at night by a certain time. And if it's not in that spot, it's gone for a week. What's the arms about? Who? <laughs> One particular child, whenever he does not put his phone back or I take it for a week, he like, oh, oh. <laughs> but dad, dad, I'm like, we gonna make it too? We can make it too. But dad, this is what he said. It's really, you're being extreme. I was like, really? I'm being extreme, so do you pay the bill? Have you ever, who bought the phone? Whose phone is it? Who owns it? Me. Did you do what you were supposed to? No. You don't choose the time, you choose the crime. If you didn't want it taken away for a week, regardless of how extreme it was, you should have put it back or done your chores before you decided to play an Xbox. So we take away the Xbox for a week. Y'all like, man, Pastor Jason is cruel. Physical discipline cleanses away evil. Such discipline purifies the heart. Discipline works. It works for children. And guess what? It works for us adults. We don't like it, but it's good for us. That's why reading through the Bible is the discipline of trying to spend time with God. And it helps. Or making sure that you, you have these books that you want to read for the first quarter, second quarter, now third quarter. It works. This next principle from taking a look at evil, I don't want to give because it's convicting. The discipline of exercise. <laughs> it was working for a moment until Miss Corona showed up. The discipline of, of abstaining from certain sweets. Ha! <laughs> And so the 30 pounds that I lost, Corona helped me find. <laughs> we don't like discipline. But when you discipline yourself, it helps. So find ways to discipline yourself. Use, if you like sweets, I'm talking to me, I'm, I'm preaching to me right now. Don't even, nobody listen to this part, all right? I'm just going to preach to Jason. Jason, if you like chocolate chips cookies so much that are warm and with a tall glass of milk, and then after you finish it, you get another tall glass of milk and four more big chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> Set your goals, and if you don't hit your goals for the week, you don't get any chocolate chip cookies. Set your own discipline and reward system. I tell my kids, yes, you can go in the freezer and get a freeze pop anytime you want. But if you don't get your, if you don't do your chores, don't reward yourself with a sweet treat. As I talk to myself, 
Learn to be disciplined and learn that loving parents discipline you. Since there's a lot of kids in here, listen up, kids. Listen, listen to your brother. Listen to Uncle Jason for a minute. Parents don't wake up in the morning trying to figure out how they're going to make your life miserable. I just trust, I know you don't want to hear this right now, but just listen. It's your parents' jobs to help you develop a disciplined life. So when you're not disciplined and they do their job, don't get mad at them for doing their job. Get mad at yourself for not doing your job. That's just... That's, he, he said, boo. <laughs> I like this guy. All right. <laughs> That's great. Let's discipline him right now. I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, bro. He's like, I hate that preacher. No, really. Like kids, you have a job. Your job is to go to school, to make up your bed. If your parents require you to make up your bed. To clean the dishes decently so we don't have to wash dishes before we eat. (laughs) That's your job. Take a look at evil, kids. See where evil shows up for yourself. Laziness has the hint of evilness. As much as adults don't like to say that. Verse Verse 4 of Proverbs 21 says this, haughty eyes, a proud heart, and evil actions are all sin. He shows us what sin is, haughty eyes, having this, this arrogant look with your eyes, looking down on people, looking at people. What made you decide to wear that? Look at, look at, oh, look at that neighborhood over there. <laughs> Haughty eyes, a proud heart. Having this, you positioning yourself where you feel better than other, you feel better than others. You see yourself as higher than other people. When we first meet people, one of the first questions we ask, what do you do for a living? Sometimes that's for networking purposes. But other times, it's so you can see where you position yourself or you position that person. Am I going to put this person in this category or am I going to put this person in that category? Am I better than them? Do they make more money than I do? Is my family better than theirs? Ah! That stuff separates you. It, it separates us. And if I know that people, <laughs> excuse me, wow, where did that come from? Sage. <laughs> If I know that people are asking me what I do for a living so that they can position themselves, I I love answering it. I say, I do something for a living to help people stop asking other people to what they do for a living. (laughs) And sometimes I ask, I say, why why you ask? Help me understand why, why, why you ask that. And I laugh. And they don't know if I'm serious or I'm joking. I'm like, both. (laughs) Evil actions, these are all sins. And Jesus said, hey, if doing this stuff is offensive or offends you or makes you sin, cut it off. Stop doing it. Verse 12 of Proverbs 21 says this, the righteous one knows what's going on in the homes of the wicked. He will bring disaster on them. God knows and trusts God that he knows what's going on when a home acts evil. He knows what's what's going on in all of our houses. But it says that he'll bring disaster on them. That's God's job, not yours. He's going to settle that account. Remember that. Our job is to be gracious and to be righteous. Don't repay evil for evil, but overcome evil with good. We see it in the scriptures. Solomon, I mean, I saw King Saul was after David. 
And David was running for his life in the wilderness, didn't do anything wrong. He's like, God, how is it that I've done nothing wrong and my enemies seem to be, uh, they, they seem to be doing well? That doesn't happen to you. You doing the right thing on your job. The person who's cheating and who's lying, they're succeeding and you're not. The kid that's cheating on his test, looking at other people's homework, sharing the homework, they seem to be doing good and you're struggling. Let God do the repaying. God knows and sees a wicked house. Don't let your house be wicked. I tell my kids, since my wife and I got married in 2000, December 2nd, 2000, we've always prayed every place that we've lived, every state that we live in, God, this world, there are a lot of people who do wrong. There's a lot of wickedness. God, allow our house to be a house of peace, a house of joy. Well, this house is a refuge from this wicked world. That when people come to our house, they get something different. When, when the solicitors come to our house, they still, and us saying no, they still get joy. And Jesus, everybody who comes to my house, knock on the door, salesman, I'm going to try to give you the gospel. Hey, thanks. I don't want what you're selling, but I'll listen to you. If your presentation is good, I'm like, that was a good presentation. Hey, let me tell you this. Let me now, can you listen to my presentation right quick? Some Mormons knocked on our door, and I was like, hey, what's up? We're laughing. I'm joking with them. Then I started asking them questions about their faith. They were like, we don't know that answer. I'm like, can you come back and find it? And they said this, this is the best house we've ever been to. I feel like y'all are our friends. <clears throat> And that thing is still in the back of my throat. <clears throat> so make sure your house is a house of peace, a house of joy, a house of God's kingdom. Let your house be an embassy of God's kingdom here on earth. The next thing that we want to look at is this thing right here. What is that? That doesn't sound like anything edible. We're going to take a look at something represented by this. Go with me. Some of y'all like an exacto knife. It's supposed to be a scaffold, but the scaffold didn't make it. So we have a scaffold blade. So what can be represented by a scaffold? Type your guesses online. What do you think? What can it represent? Self-harm. Who? Self-harm. I heard something over here. Healing. Healing. <laughs> okay. We got two good guesses. Somebody else? Warthog. I, you got to yell it out loud. I can't. Cutting away disease. Man, these are three great answers. I heard something over here. What would I hear over here? Y'all don't like talking out loud in church? I don't know. <laughs> Surgery. Okay, here it is. We use this, or physicians use this, to help look inside of us. So the next point that we're taking out in the Sage of Wisdom is take a look at yourself. Proverbs 20 and verse 29 says this. I struggle with this verse the last few months. The glory of the young men, young, the glory of the young is their strength. The gray hair of experience is the splendor of the old man. I'm getting old. In the midst of the pandemic, I noticed something about my hair. My beard started getting a lot of gray in it. <laughs> I was on an airplane, reached up for my luggage and sprang a muscle in my arm. 
Listen, I'm, I'm telling you, nobody ever told me this in church. So if you're in your 30s and early 40s, let me tell you what's about to happen. You're about to start using the bathroom a lot. <laughs> two days ago, two days ago, I got up at 3 o'clock in the morning to use the bathroom. I came back to get in the bed. I caught a cramp in my calf muscle. How do you get a cramp in your calf muscle and you haven't run track in over 20 years? And so this aging thing, this is, is messing with me, y'all. I'm growing gray hairs in places I didn't think. Nobody ever tells you this in church. I'm just telling y'all, they, they never said anything about it, so I'm confused about life. But it says this, the gray hair, thank you. I talk, I used to talk for two hours and didn't need water. I could drink without it spilling out my mouth. I'm telling you, this stuff is amazing. It's working now. Yeah, this is, wow. Yeah, so things just, things seem to be falling apart <laughs> by the second. <laughs> and for this young 45-year-old man, I'm like, oh, what in the world is going on? But I look at this proverb and say, man, that's the glory of an old man. I love talking to older men, they're like, just get ready for it. You wake up once. Think about waking up three times. <laughs> the glory of, of young men or young people is strength. I, I pulled an all-nighter. I want an all-nighter. I used to, when I was a youth pastor, I used to love lock-ins in my early days. I can't stand them. I do a lock-in, I, I don't do them anymore because it takes me a week or two to recover from them. <laughs> and so young people brag on their strength. My little daughter, Dad, look at that muscle. Little boys, look in the shirt. My son like, Dad, I got a six-pack. <laughs> of Capri Suns? <laughs> Dad, can you get me this muscle shirt? Like, you get some muscles first. And so when you, when you glory in your strength as young people, and when you glory in your, your experience as older people, it's strength versus experience. And that draws a wedge. And we won't be united. We'll always be looking down on each other instead of getting caught up with the glory of God. Verse 2 of Proverbs 21 says, people may be right in their own eyes, but the Lord examines the heart. You may try to argue or make your point that you're right all of the time, but God knows your heart. God really knows what's going on inside, and God doesn't need Scooby-Doo and the Mystery Machine Bunch to chase you do a mystery to pull the mask off of your face. God knows who you are. You're like, I, wouldn't have, I would have got away with it and it wouldn't have been for God. <laughs> You can't fool God. Bob Marley said it like this. You can fool some people sometimes, but you can't fool all the people all the time. But now you see the right. Hey. Stand up for your right. Oh. Abraham Lincoln gave a similar quote. Abraham Lincoln said this. You may fool people for a time. You can fool a part of the people all of the time. But you can't fool all the people all of the time. And you can never fool God at any time. 
God knows. And sometimes, especially if you marry or have a, a long-term relationship, there's a certain person in the relationship who always thinks they're right. And I don't understand why ladies are like this. <laughs> <laughs> so Layla. <later. laughs> and so in relationships, we try to argue, and we try to argue and manipulate. Now, nah, you're not fooling God, even if you get away with it, and use your manipulation skills to make somebody think that they're wrong. Here's what God says in the Scriptures, just talking about God. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. God knows what you're thinking. You're not pulling anything on him. Verse 4 says this, you know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. God knows you're about to manipulate before any word or any emotion comes out that you try to manipulate people with. You can't fool God. You can't. And if we're going to live life with wisdom, having a taste of wisdom, you want to make sure that your heart for God is what's actually lived out, being consistent, being authentic to who God has made you. Last one is this right here. It's not a pig heart. It's a human heart. No, that would be weird. If we say, we're going to eat some hearts today, I'm like, yeah, I'm out of this church. I'm going through that door. It's a heart. What could the heart represent? Take a look at what? Come on, somebody. Who said that? Love. He's like, yeah, I'm, I'm one for three. I'm killing it right now. <laughs> take a look at love. Let's take a look at love. Here's what Proverbs 20 verse 28 says, listen to this, unfailing love and faithfulness protect the king. His throne is made secure through love. What in the world? Dude, fellas, when, 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 when I think of a king all of my life, when I thought about a king, I thought about swords, an army, and strong, strength, fighting, Arr! throw them to the lions. Arr! He's saying... His throne is made secure through love? What in the world? Is the king getting soft? <laughs> I'm going to make my throne secure through love. That's not what he's saying. But the king or queen of the castle, how do you secure your home? Do you secure your home? with people by threatening? If you're an employee, I mean employer, if you have a, your own business, if you're self-employed, or you're, you're in upper management, middle management, how do you secure your team and make your team feel secure? Are you always leading with the iron fist by force or is it by love? There's a story of a ruler of this land and he got him assistant, a that he wanted to help rule. He said, okay, here's what we're going to do. Since I'm the ruler, I'm going to enforce all the rules. I'm going to make the people obey me. He said, but I don't want it to be too hard, so I want you to be the good cop. I want you to love on people and help them enjoy themselves. So that's what they started doing. The leader, the king, he started ruling people, making sure that they were um, abiding by his decrees. And if he didn't do it, he would punish him. And then the guy who, who was under him made sure that he helped people enjoy life and loved them. And the king started seeing as he was ruling by force and this other one was ruling by love that the people started enjoying him more. They loved his assistant more than they loved him. So then he changed. He's like, all right, we need to change this. Now I'm going to start loving the people and making sure they're having a good time enjoying it. And you start enforcing the rules and the decrees. And as they did that, what the king saw is that the people accepted the other guy's discipline because of the love and the joy that they had. 
But because the king ruled when it came time for him to start loving them and creating a context where they enjoyed them, they didn't trust the king. You want to secure your company, your home, your team? Make sure your team knows that you love them. The way that you build businesses or, or, or really seal contracts, a lot of times it's not based off of what you got. It's the relationships that you have with people. There's so many things that I've gotten because of my relationships. And with the business that my wife and I run, we want to make sure that the people who we do business with reflect our relationship and our values. There's this one restaurant in our community. We love this restaurant because we love the people. And there are times when we're trying to decide where we're going to eat. Do we go home and save some money with eight people in our home? Six greedy kids. <laughs> and there are times when we make the decision that we're just going to go to the restaurant. We're just, we'll fix the budget next week. Because we want our kids to be around the families that are part of this restaurant. Because of love. Verse 9 of Proverbs 21 says this. It is better to live alone in the corner of an attic. Woo! Than, in a, than with a quarrelsome wife in a lovely home. It's better for you to stay in a hot attic with no fan. Got to watch your steps so you won't fall through the sheetrock. You're itching because fiberglass is starting to get in your skin. It's better to live like this where there's no plumbing than in a lovely house with a quarrelsome wife. Whoop! Say amen, fellas, son of fellas. I ain't saying amen right now, bro. I ain't. <laughs> Sometimes we just wish. But sometimes it, it, it doesn't say with the wife who fights for no reason. Maybe sometimes you want to live in the attic, fellas, it's because you, there's something that you're not doing that's causing your wife and her strength to be quarrelsome. Right? <laughs> the ladies were waiting for one lady to say amen. Can somebody <laughs> clap because I don't want to. Quarrelsome is the opposite of love. Who wants, who wants a quarrelsome marriage relationship? It's not joyful and it's not fun. It's miserable. It's miserable. Every marriage has these. It's amazing. My wife and I, we, we, you know, we travel the country talking about this marriage stuff. And for the life of me, I don't understand how is it that I was praying for this woman. Did God, did God let her say yes? And God blessed me with it. How is it? I wasn't asking God, God, give me a beautiful woman that I can have the greatest moments in my life with, but also let us be able to fuss about red lights and green lights and where to park. God, help, help us. Get, bless me a woman. This really happened. Bless me with a woman where we can fuss about the babysitter's, um, the cookie dough that she made. And um, she, my wife threw them away because she didn't trust the babysitter's cleanliness. And I'm like, they were chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> we pray for them and bless that mess. God turns it into good stuff. And we're fussing over chocolate chip cookies. One time we were fussing over ice cream flavors. And both of us love each other and love God. Woo! But sometimes people who love each other and love Jesus get distracted. Marriage wasn't meant to be miserable. 
When Adam saw Eve, he didn't say, this is bone of my bone and pressure on my nerves. <laughs> That's what it feels like sometimes. And so if you're going through this, which all of us hit those ebb and flows of the marriage, it has that. Don't sit in it. Do something about it. Get some help. Find a marriage event. That's why I'm super, super excited. On October the 8th, Terry Earls, my wife, and I, we do marriage retreats, marriage events across the country. On October the 8th, we're coming here to do a marriage event at Gold Creek. So, I'm going to tell some jokes. I'm going to do my stand-up comedy, which y'all never seen. Sorry, kids, you can't come, because sometimes I tell Christian adult clean jokes. <laughs> Verse 23 says this, watch your tongue and keep your mouth shut. Amen, somebody. <laughs> we about to get in trouble. <laughs> and you will stay out of trouble. Let's keep your mouth shut sometimes. Watch your tongue. That's what the Bible says, not me. Teenagers, woo! Students, sometimes just keep your mouth closed. God blessed me with six kids, and one of them has this intellectual gift. Dude is super smart. Concrete, sequential, very logical in his thinking. You leaving, bro? You got that mad? <laughs> <laughs> and my son, I noticed his intellectual prowess when he was young, when he was developing. I was like, he's got a gift. And I need to make sure I help him cultivate that. So I help him have discussions. But sometimes I say, son, there's one thing to be intellectual. There's a whole other thing to be wise. You can be an intellectual fool. You can have straight A's and still be stupid and get your teeth knocked out. <laughs> so I tell him, like, son, when I say stop, the conversation's over. And sometimes he'll try to keep going. I'm like, dude, watch your mouth. Keep your mouth shut and you'll stay out of, you'll stay out of trouble. Well, sometimes we got to keep going. This happened, fellas, the other week. Sometimes we cannot say anything to avoid an argument, but sometimes not saying something turns into an argument. Woo! Come on the 8th. We'll tell you about this. This happened two weeks ago, and we love talking about our stuff on stage. Pretty awesome. We had to write letters to get it straight. Kenny Rogers said this, you got to know <laughs> when to hold them. And know when to fold them, know when to walk away, know when to run. Whew, that's a good day. Chuck D said it like this. When I get mad at write it down on the pad, uh, give a brother man something he never had. Y'all don't know who Chuck D is? Y'all don't. <laughs> Chuck D is a rapper from the 80s. And he said this. When I get mad, I don't go off. I write it down on the pad. And therefore, I give a brother man something he never had. When I get angry, instead of spewing out, I get creative and write it down, and then I produce this gold artistically. Verse 21 says this, whoever pursues righteousness and unfailing love will find life, righteousness, and honor. You see that? Whoever. If you are a business owner and you want to have an honorable business, pursue righteousness. Do business the right way. Pursue unfailing love for your customers, for your employees. If you are a parent, pursue honor by being a righteous parent, by being a righteous spouse, by being a, and showing unfailing love. If you're a student, be a righteous student. Showing unfailing love for your classmates, for your teachers, for the custodians, for the cafeteria workers. That's 
how you make an impact. And God has called us Jesus followers to be impactful, to leave a taste of sage in the world. And that oftentimes means don't talk in uh, and giving evil when evil's given to you. I close on this. Yesterday was a big day for me. It was my wife's birthday, my wife's birthday. She was going to come on this trip with me, but she didn't uh, because we had was just busy. School started in Texas. I had a big fundraising event to do last night for an organization. And uh, after the event, we went to the airport. She dropped me off for my 10.25 p.m. flight last night. I met my gate at 10.20. <laughs> I saw her like, am I at the right gate? They're like, yeah, you're at the right gate, but we got another flight before this one. 11.15 comes, no plane. They gave us another flight, 11.20, no plane. Finally, they said we have a plane, but we got a staff. It's going to take an hour to clean it. Finally, I got on the plane in my seat at 12.20, late 12.30 this morning. Fell asleep, as I always do on planes. Landed in Seattle at 2.25. 2.25, get the, catch the shuttle. Shuttles takes me to the rental car place. Said, we'll be right here because no rental cars are open. I'm like, I'm executive elite with National. I got me a car. Go down. Everybody's gone. It's closed. It's like, man, do I Uber up here to Mill Creek? Or do I just go back to the airport, get a hotel, and then work it out early in the morning, get here to preach this message? I did a little calculation because my wife is in charge of the finances. I looked at it like, yeah, it's better to Uber. So I Ubered up here, got to my hotel. They said, Mr. Earls, we don't have a room for you. I'm like, bro, I got status. You see my confirmation number right here, like, yeah, we, this time we don't, we don't have any rooms. <laughs> I'm gonna give you my confirmation number again, and I'm gonna give you my rewards number. Mr. Earls, we don't have a room. We made reservations before today. You can't, I can't catch an Uber anywhere else, not at now three is four o'clock in the morning. Dude, hey man, dude, am I going, uh, I can't sleep outside. Or oh, the hotel room, he was, I mean, hotel lobby, like, we can work that out. I'm like, no, I, I need a room. I got to rest. I got to, in the morning. So what if I pay for tomorrow and just, it's like, let me see. He said, why are you here? I'm like, dude, I leave at three o'clock today. It's now four in the morning. I leave at three. I just got to, I'm going to preach at a church. He's like, you are, uh, what do you call it? Are you a Christian? I was like, yeah, I am, man. I was like, Lord, I hope, I looked at him, but I knew I had to give unfailing love. He's like, man, it's funny. We do that, we got to run. All of a sudden, the room just magically appeared. Now I get to my room at 4.30ish in the morning. <laughs> I got to be here at 8 o'clock. Do I go to sleep? Like, let me review the message. And I'm looking at this thing. Take a look at love. I'm like, oh, how much love did I show that guy at the counter? Was I disrespectful to him? No. I got a little bit of stern, a little bit. That's okay. That's like, but did I really show him as much as grace as I could have? I was like, no, I didn't, I didn't give him a tip. So I went back. I said, hey, man, you got some water? He was like, yeah, you got to pay for the water. Like, bro, see my status. I get at least two free bottles of water. Like, yeah, I'm sorry, sir. I'm like, man, thanks for all your help, dude. Here you go. He's like, no, I don't want the tip. I'm like, dude, take it. Like, no. And then I tossed the tip on the counter, and then I walked away. Why did I do that? Did he deserve the tip after lying to me saying they didn't have a room? No, he ain't deserve a tip. He got a tip all right. Don't cancel my reservation. 
For why do I do that? Because here's what Jesus said. The same love that you've received from me, give it to others. You want to live a life that tastes like wisdom? Love like Jesus loved. How has Jesus loved you? He's forgiven you or will forgive you for your top five sins that you're embarrassed to talk about. Your top five. What are your top five sins? You don't want to tell them out loud. The very things that you are shameful and embarrassed about, Jesus forgive, has forgiven you for, and he wants you to forgive others. There's no greater love than this, that a man lays down his life for friends. And so that's why we remember Jesus. So in just a second, I want you to go and get your elements. I'm going to dismiss you all, and you come up here, and then we'll come back and commune together. So let's take this moment to remember the love that Jesus gave us. Would you all stand? Go ahead and get your elements that are around here, around the walls, and we'll come back and commune together. take this because it represents Jesus' body. Nothing weird about it. It's just a taste of a piece of bread where we think about Jesus. Jesus came down to earth. He died. He was crucified on the cross. He was beaten, pierced in his side so that we, so that we can have eternal life. So we take this piece of bread and as we eat it, let's think about Jesus. And then this juice or the wine, whatever it is that you have, it represents Jesus' blood that he shed on the cross. Now, he, he shed his blood because it's the blood that forgives us, that washes us clean, clean from our sins. So that top five that we just talked about, Jesus forgives you. God forgives you because of this. So, as we drink this, let's think about the things that Jesus has forgiven us for and made us righteous. Ah, I'm so grateful for him forgiving me and I trust that you would go and forgive others like Jesus has forgiven you. We're so grateful for you to hang out with us, to worship with us right here online and we'd love to keep in contact with you. In fact, I've asked him, I said, man, can we take prayer requests? Because I personally want to pray for you. So if you uh, type prayer into the chat right now, uh, they'll give you a code where you can send your prayer requests. And I personally, as well as others here, want to pray for you. Thank you so much. For real. Y'all, thanks for coming to hang out with us. We pray that next week you come and that God uses Gold Creek to help you become even more golden in this life. God bless you. We'll see you.